eight. All right, here we go. Let's see. All right, good evening, friends online, and hello, friends in person. Uh, my name is Patrick Vane. I'm the senior pastor at Georgetown Baptist Church, and you are joining us for our Sunday night prayer book study. And we are so glad that you are with us. If you are online, we would love for you to comment and say hello uh, so that we have an opportunity to greet you. So thank you for joining us. And friends in the room, thank you for being here as well. Uh, we are, after last week, needing to take off for weather. Uh, we are back. And only three more chapters to go. So we are getting very close to the end of the book. And in fact... This chapter and the next chapter are pretty tiny, so uh, we'll see uh, how much we all have to talk about uh, what we can get through. So uh, we don't forget uh, the K-Count uh, event is this uh, week. It is going to be on Wednesday. If you are interested in helping uh, either by actually coming to the gathering place and helping to serve or by making a crock pot of soup, or by continuing over the next couple of days, if you want to donate, um, I think we still need hats and there was one other one that we needed. It wasn't gloves, socks, ha hats and socks. So if you're interested in doing that, uh, then we would love to have you bring those in the next couple of days. Um, there are all kinds of signups for all the stuff that's happening on Wednesday uh, over in the hub and the bulletin board. So if you're interested in that, make sure you stop by there on the way out. Uh, but we are, we're ready to go with that. So I think that's all the office keep, upkeep I need to let you know about. So before we begin, let's pray. We thank you, God, for this time. And we thank you for this chance to learn more about prayer, to wrestle and reflect together, to draw closer to you. God, guide our conversation and guide our thoughts, guide our questions, guide our discussions so that we can better know, better serve, and better love you. We praise you and we thank you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right. We are in chapter eight tonight. So we are uh, excited about that. And it is uh, laboring in prayer. So... Uh, they, uh, he begins the story, he begins the chapter by talking about D.L. Moody, Dwight Moody. And he tells this story about Dwight Moody that, uh, you know, they're uh, sort of competing thoughts about whether, how truthful this is, but it's too good a story not to tell. Um, and he tells this story that Dwight Moody made a list at one point in his ministry. So Dwight Moody was a preacher uh, a long time ago. Um, preached to all sorts of people. In fact, uh, it's rumored that, you know, at one point there were 30,000 people at one time that came and heard him preach. So he is a really dynamic preacher. He made a list of 100 friends who had not come to faith and um, would pray over that list every single day. And that would be one of the faithful practices that he would do is he would pray over that list every single day. And it was said that by the time that uh, he died and his funeral came about, that 96 of those people had come to faith. And then at his funeral, the other four made a profession of faith. And uh, it talks and, and what they talk about and what they sort of use with that to help uh, begin and to help think through this idea of laboring in prayer is this sense of light, and, and we will use this idea of labor um, continually, but this idea of this is not something that you uh, sort of 
do lightly and offhandedly. This is something you are committed to. This is something that you um, in that you com that you uh, bear down on. This is something that you hold on to, and that you make sure that you are dedicating yourself to. That this type of prayer, this type of connection, is. Uh, because God wants to do this, this is one of those areas where we talk about the power of prayer and we talk about how prayer is birthing something new and how to be a part of that and to tap into that. We have to understand that God uh, is doing something bigger than just what we want, but God is at work in this and we get an opportunity to be a part of it. So uh, I don't know, uh, it's not, you know, no pressure if you um, haven't caught up and haven't read, but if you have, is there a part of this chapter that you want to make sure we talk about, uh, something that you would like to share or something that stuck out to you? I don't know if this is the kind of question you had in mind. <laughs> Okay. It, it talks about how it's not fashionable to say born again. And he says, some guy with a fiery sign and a bullhorn in Times Square made that a bad look for all of us. You know what that what happened? So I don't I don't think he is speaking about one person in particular. I think what he is talking about um, are and I I don't know if you all have them, but uh, any, you know, any of the like baseball games I would go to in Maryland uh, or Nationals games or those games, any of that, there's a guy with a bullhorn as people are walking into the stadium and he's got, he's got an actual sign. And this sign is, I mean, it's, it is, it is this big and it's got like 12 point font on it. And it says God hates and it has listed single spaced two or three columns of people. And the guy is standing there yelling into a bullhorn. And, uh, and it's, uh, I like to see the list because I I'm curious how many times I made it. And uh, <laughs> it's um, multiple ones for me, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, people who like rock and roll. I mean, some of them you make sense. Some of them it, it makes sense for what the stereotype would be. But then there was one that you know, people like rock and roll. Um, you know, women who paint their nails. Uh, you know, like the, just random things that. Uh, well, it's not people's names. It's it's categories. It's categories of people, and he is. It seems to me the strategy, uh, whether just, it, it, whether, I mean, possibly he's just provoking for the sake of provoking, but I think the strategy is for you to identify yourself on here and then be curious about what you did wrong and engage with him and talk to him about it, I think is what he thinks is going to happen. But my argument and lots of people's argument is uh, I, I don't want to go closer to bullhorn guy I am repelled from bullhorn guy. That bullhorn guy doesn't um, doesn't draw me into a beautiful, wonderful faith. Um, uh, when, when I think bullhorn guy, my my fear at that point is that I am, uh, you know, what am I going to do that's going to cause God to zap me? kind of thing. So I don't think he's talking, um, Allison, about one person in particular. I think he's talking about kind of the stereotype that there is this, you know, kind of like turn or burn kind of guy who really antagonistically is ready to provoke. And uh, it's, I would be curious if, like I said, I'd be curious if the provoking is on purpose and if he if he feels like he wins, if a lot of people yell and cuss at him because he feels like he's persecuted or something. I don't, I don't know, but uh, I, I think that's what uh, he's speaking of. And you all, uh, context is king in everything. Where you are location-wise matters. Uh, the, kind of, the kind of ministry challenges and problems that we had in Maryland are not exactly the same ones that we have here. I mean, it just, it's different 
issues and challenges and problems. And so uh, I don't, I don't know, maybe you all have bullhorn people here, but uh, I, there were, there, there were a few that, that really uh, felt like they were, they were doing God's work. So there was one on the campus in UK. Okay. Said, there you go. Every morning, walking past the same building, you should, well, usually like Thursdays or Fridays. Yeah. You, yelling mostly at my email co-students about what, what they It came to do. Eastern too? Sure did. Been, been getting into the night before. Maybe the, maybe early in the week he was at Eastern and he went to, he had like a, like a, like a loop. Yeah, like a loop. He got a, yeah. Hit them all. Yeah. Uh, but do what? Do you remember his name? Uh, I Uncle never Jed. got anywhere near it. Jed. Uncle Jed. Yes, it was Jed. So there's <laughs> one guy. <laughs> I, I know yeah, there's just... probably about 35 years between you and me. But it was Uncle Jed. It was Jed. It was Uncle Jed. Is that right? Oh, you wouldn't believe what he called the women. I probably would. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, I, I I probably would. Yeah. What what were you all saying? Is... The guy the guy that he's talking about, you know, he had a he had a nickname and I can't remember what his nickname was. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well he ended up in the studio and it was like a free speech here. Oh somebody would call him. Yeah. yeah. Well and that's <laughs> but there was one came to Georgetown College who was there but he was there with my daughter was, and it was awful. Yeah, this is, you know, whether it's Uncle Jed or uh, whoever, this is the person that they are talking about. And, you know, look, we don't, we don't need any help to look bad. Like we're doing a good enough job lo looking bad as Christians as it is right now. We certainly don't need any help. But um, the, the kind of, that kind of language, um, it, it, has not been as persuasive in my experience. How about that? When my uh, when my grandmother found out that I had joined a Baptist church, she yeah yeah. I was like, no, 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 no grandma. <laughs> I mean, she's she well, she grew up in Bulls Gap, Tennessee, and all they had were Baptist churches and they were the very yeah beating the Bible on the pulpit screaming at you at the top of your lungs about how you were going straight to hell every Sunday uh, and but she moved with my grandfather up north of Chicago and so really all she heard about Baptist was that. what she saw on the news <laughs> and, and protests at the funerals funeral soldiers yeah yeah and so she, she was very concerned before I Explain to her that it's nothing like that. I, I've been in several churches where the joke has been, uh, we need shirts that say not that kind of Baptist. Because uh, uh, we, and in, in Maryland, we had serious discussion about changing the name because uh, Maryland is a very Catholic state. Now it's it's mostly non-church now, but, but the kind of, the culture that people swim in, even if they don't go to church, is sort of Catholicism. And so they're already sort of looking sort of with askew eyes at us about like, what are you doing and who are you and what, what are you about? And uh, so it, uh, there was a lot of sort of explaining of this, not that, but this, not this, but that kind of thing. So I, I think that's that sort of picture and that sort of idea of you know, you really, you really have sort of a baby in the bathwater kind of situation because you, the idea of repentance is biblical. The idea of recognizing that we are wrong and we have done wrong and our temptation is to continue to do wrong. And wrong is not just thinking wrong. Wrong is actively doing wrong. Sometimes we are actively setting ourselves and everybody else on fire in our wrongness. And it is helpful and right for us to hear, hey, this isn't right. This needs to change. And like we've talked about, and you've probably heard before, when we talk about repentance, we're talking about turning around. We're talking about an actual, the, the word repentance actually means to physically turn and go the other way. So it is, 
it is not just a sense of I've made a decision in my heart and prayed a prayer. It is I am actively choosing to do different because I recognize what I did before was not the way that I need to be. Of Jesus to see, you know, there are times that uh, Jesus used other means rather than, you know, uh, rather than just direct sort of confrontation to try and get the message across and try and engage people. And the the idea here of bullhorn guy isn't who we want to be, but it doesn't mean that that language of born again, that and especially in terms of laboring, in terms of God is doing something new here and inviting you to be a part of it. And what would that look like? Well, labor looks like that. It looks like something that is difficult and hard work and takes time and effort. And uh, it is, you know, that there is that sense to it of you are now in this kind of fight. And by choosing to be in this fight, you get to see something beautiful happen. And it is all worth it in the end, is the idea. And I think he, he even uses that example in this chapter of the, you know, the the couple that uh, it took forever for the first baby to come. And, and, you know, it's not three weeks later and she goes, I'm ready for another one. You know, and that sense of it's it's time and it's better and it's ready, but that doesn't happen without the hard work and without sort of that work with God. So does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Wait, okay. I'm Jed or <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that's exactly it. Uncle Jed. I love that. I love that. That's great. Well, hello, friends. I don't know who's still with us between Sarah and Wayne and Abby and Carol and Melissa, but uh, whoever is there, I'm glad you're here and joining us tonight. So uh, I know it's a little glitchy. Sorry about that. Our internet's a little wonky right now. But uh, okay, anybody else have something that they want to share or point out that was meaningful or they have a question about? Do. All right. Well, in that case, let's talk about Elijah. Because that's who he talks about next. So Elijah, uh, Elijah is an Old Testament prophet. Probably don't need to tell you all this. You are here on a uh, Sunday night for a prayer book study. But Elijah is an Old Testament prophet. And uh, he is using Elijah to sort of uh, make a bigger point about the kind of work that God is doing and how God works in the midst of this laboring. And so uh, I think it'd be helpful if we were to read there um, has been this huge drought. Uh, Ahab is the evil king and Elijah is God's prophet who has gone up against him. So if you um, if you want to follow your Welcome to just listen, but um, if you want to follow along, you can. Uh, we are going to be in 1 Kings 18, and we're going to start um, in verse 16. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Elijah called the drought and said God's going to shut off the taps uh, for a while, and so that's why Ahab is mad. So uh, 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 16. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. When he saw Elijah, he said to him, Is that you, you troubler of Israel? I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied, but you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and you have followed the Baals. So there was this question in this time. Uh, the kingdom had gone through civil war, had divided into two kingdoms. Uh, the kings of the north were bad. They were more prosperous, had more people, had more money, had more influence and power, but they succumbed to the temptation of worshiping the gods around them because all of the other nations around them all had these sort of same type of, of gods and uh, the Israel stuck out. Israel was different. And God had intended for that to be. God, in fact, said, that's the whole point. You're not going to be like your neighbors. But throughout this part of Old Testament history, the push and the temptation for all of God's people, we want, our, it looks like our neighbors are doing great. We want to be like them. We don't want to be stuck with what we have. They have what looks good, whether it was a king 
or whether it was the gods that they worshipped. And so the temptation was to worship these gods. And some, if not all of these gods, um, did horrific things like child sacrifice, things that um, were you know, abhorrent to God and abhorrent to, to should have been to God's people, but they were so tempted by uh, the surrounding culture and by everything else that, that they were dabbling in this and turning away from God. You have abandoned the Lord's command and you have and you have followed the Baal. So verse 19, now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah, another God, who eat at Jezebel's table. Jezebel is Ahab's wife and they didn't get along either. Um, hey, Nita. <clears throat> so Ahab sent word throughout all Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Uh, I'm going to say caramel before the night's over, so just, it's almost happened twice and it's coming, so just be on the lookout. Elijah went before the people and said, so so there has been this sort of, uh, hey Wanda, Elijah has, has uh, you know, summoned the people in this sort of grand showdown. So, uh, you know, if you're an agrarian country and you have two years of drought, this is devastating. I mean, people are dying. This is horrific. The king looks embarrassed because the king uh, is supposed to, through Jezebel's, all of his wife's priests and prophets, they're supposed to be controlling the weather and they can't do anything. So Elijah has called all of the priests and prophets from from these false prophets over here. And it's Elijah over here and has called all of Israel to come see this. So Elijah, sort of with this kind of um, sort of bold stroke, and he goes before all the people, verse 21. How long will you waver between two opinions? Uh, yeah, there we, we go. How long will you waver? Where did we go? Do, 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 do. Uh, there we go. How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. So, what Elijah sees happening is that same kind of uh, golden calf kind of thing that we talked about back with Moses, where they sort of thought they could, you know, kind of cover their bases, where, you know, sure, we absolutely 100% trust God, but I'm also going to have the insurance policy right here of this golden calf. So in case God doesn't provide, we're going to be safe. So what Elijah is seeing is they're not rejecting God, but they are wondering if they might not need to just put a bet on every God possible. So whichever one comes through, they'll be set to go. And Elijah is saying, it's not going to work like that. You either have to pick Baal or you have to pick God. But the people said nothing. Then Elijah said to them, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left. But Baal has 450 prophets. Get two bulls for us. Let them choose one for themselves and let them cut it into pieces and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. I will prepare the other bull and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. Then you call on the name of your God and I will call on the name of the Lord the God who answers by fire, he is God. Man, is there anything more, when you think of like stereotypical Old testament -y, <laughs> is there anything more stereotypical Old testament -y than a prophet raging at a bunch of people who are doing wrong, ready to call down fire? There's some sort of weird sacrifice of animals happening. Um, there's going to be like... Uh, all this other stuff going on. So uh, you kind of have it all here and uh, all the bits and pieces of it going. Um, questions, comments? We good so far? You know, every day, normal. This is what happens. Then all the people said, okay. <laughs> they said, what you say is good. Sure, why not? Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one of the bulls. You get to pick whichever one you want. Doesn't matter. And prepare it first, since there are so many of you. Call on the name of your God, but do not light the fire. So they took the bull given them and prepared it. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon, 
O Baal, answer us, they shouted. But there was no response. No one answered. And they danced around the altar they had made. And at noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely is a God. Surely he is a God. Perhaps he is deep in thought or busy or traveling. Maybe he is sleeping and must be awakened. So they shouted louder and slashed themselves uh, with, uh, well, okay. All right, you're all adults. I can tell you this. The Hebrew here, uh, the English here gets prettied up a little bit because the Hebrew here is a little bit more um, descriptive uh, because what Elijah is suggesting is not necessarily that their gods are asleep. What Elijah is suggesting is maybe their gods are indisposed right now and you need to call louder because maybe they just can't come to the phone. So you're going to have to call louder because they're in the potty right now. And uh, in, in sort of uh, kind of very uh, stark and pointed language. Uh, I years ago and I wondered if you would bring that. Yeah, this is not a, they have, they have, um, you know, it's, I'm, well, maybe I was going to say it's hard to sell Bibles. Maybe they would sell more Bibles if they, uh, if they had it like that. But um, they have, they have smoothed a little bit of that kind of language. Just like um, uh, when Paul talks about, I consider it uh, all uh, refuse. I consider it all, um, you know, junk or however they translate it. Um there's a word that he uses that you all don't know that I know that I know. And, uh, and the word that he uses, if you were to translate the straight English word, uh, you all would not be happy with me. So, um, but surely he is God. Perhaps he is deep in thought or busy or traveling. <laughs> Maybe he's sleeping and must be awakened. So they shouted louder and slashed themselves with swords and spears as was their custom until their blood flowed. Midday passed and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time of the evening sacrifice. They've been going at this all day long. And, you know, uh, Elijah's over in one of those little pop-up chairs, I guess, you know, maybe has a little fan on him. And uh, so just sort of waiting them out. There was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, come here to me. And they came to him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord, which was in ruin. Elijah took 12 stones, one for each of the tribes descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Your name shall be Israel. With the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he dug a trench around it, large enough to hold two seas of seed. So uh, large enough to hold quarts of volume in this trench. Okay, so he's taking time building this thing. He's taking time repairing the, t the, uh, the altar that had been sort of just fallen into disrepair. He is putting back together, which should have been used to connect to God, but had been forgotten so that these other things, these new things, these shinier things, that, so as people were tempted to go that way, he is restoring what should be, but he is doing the hard work of this. He is not just snapping his fingers. He's not just throwing some sticks together and going, oh, that'll be fine. He's doing the hard work of putting things together, back together the way that it should be. He is taking the time to do this, even though this is going to be labor intensive, even though this is going to take even longer. All right. He arranged the wood cut the bowl into pieces and laid it on the wood. And then he said to them, fill four large jars of water and pour it on the offering and on the wood. Now, you've been in a drought for two years. You don't know when this drought is going to end, right? When he orders these people to take these four large jars of water, there is someone in the group, in the crowd, who's calculating how much he's wasting, right? 
there's somebody in the crowd who's probably getting mad, probably getting vocally mad about, hey, that could be water we're drinking. What are you doing? What's going on? But Elijah is creating this sort of elaborate sacrifice. And this elaborate sacrifice is costly. This elaborate sacrifice requires faith because, you know, Elijah needs to drink too. This elaborate sacrifice is stepping out, trusting that, you know, what happens when the king and the queen have 450 priests on their side and it's just you, you probably don't get to call it a draw if it doesn't work out between the two of you. If you don't win decisively, you are going to lose everything. Right. I mean, there, there's there's no like, well, better luck next time. Maybe you know, like we tied today. So maybe tomorrow we'll come back and try it again. Good luck to both of you. Everybody get a juice cup on your way out. Uh, so he he is putting himself on the line and he is creating this costly sacrifice that you probably could hear. I mean, you could have anyway, but you probably could hear a pin drop as all of this water is splashing on these wo- this wood and these pieces of, of meat, right? So he pours them all out. Then verse 34, do it again, he says. Now everybody's going, okay, come on, right? Like, what are you doing? Like, we get it. Once is enough. Now you're just being flashy. Stop it. Do it a third time, he ordered. He keeps going over. The water ran down through the altar and even filled the trench. And at the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, O Lord, answer me so these people will know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you are turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. If you start a fire that starts burning up stones, I am going to run away as fast as I can from you, because I don't know what you're doing, but I don't want to be around it. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. Then Elijah commanded them, seize the prophets of Baal. Don't let anyone get away. And they seized them and Elijah had them brought to the Kishon Valley and slaughtered there. Old Testament all over the place, right? And Elijah said to Ahab, go eat and drink for there is the sound of a heavy rain. So Ahab went off to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed to the top of Carmel, bent down to the ground, put his face between his knees. Now, right, this is not how we normally pray, right? If you stood up there for your deacon time and prayed like this, (laughs) be like, I'm so glad to be your new deacon. Let's pray, everybody. Uh, we would wonder if something was going on with you. and uh, But this is how he prayed. And details in the Bible aren't just there for fun, right? I mean, they don't, if this didn't matter, they wouldn't say anything. So this is intentional and this is pur- purposeful. He bent down to the ground, put his face between his knees, Go and look toward the sea, he told his servant. And he went up and looked. Uh, There's nothing there, he said. Seven times Elijah said, go back. And the seventh time the servant reported, a cloud as small as a man's hand is rising from the sea. So Elijah said, go and tell Ahab, hitch up your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. It hasn't rained for two years, but you better hurry up and go 
because the rain is coming and it's going to come so fast and so hard, you're not going to be able to get out if you don't leave now. Meanwhile, the sky grew black with clouds, the wind rose, a heavy rain came on, and Israel, nope, no, Ahab, rode off to Jezreel. The power of the Lord came upon Elijah, and tucking his cloak into his belt, he ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. So there's, you know, there's like 70 things that you could ask questions about here, right? Like it really, uh, I'm... I'm curious, what what's on the top of your list that you either have questions about or insight? Tucked into his belt, you said? Yeah. Like, girded his loins? Or? He girded his loins. So, uh, you know, if, you're, if you wear robes all the time, um, it's hard to run. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, in, in Jesus' time, and I, I think it translates here too, um, Adult men don't run. I mean, that that's seen as um, sort of scandalous. And the reason it's scandalous is because you have to gird your loins. So you, the, you got two, I mean, you got two options. You either take your, take your robe like this and run, or you, you sort of diaper yourself is the best sort of verb I can use. And you wrap it all around you, and then you run. That's what's happening here. Also, by the way, uh, and obviously that's why it's scandalous. It's not because they have a problem with, uh, you know, exertion, but they they have a problem with, um, you know, running around or running around like that. So it's even more amazing when uh, the prodigal son's dad runs past everybody else it's already, uh, for a thousand reasons we've talked about before, and you'll hear me talk about again, it's already crazy, this story of the prodigal son. But when he comes home, the dad runs past everybody else to make sure that he gets to him first. He is willing to have the embarrassment and the mockery of him because his love for his son is so great. He wants nothing bad to come to him. And if in, in short, long story short, if he doesn't get to the sun first, lots of bad stuff is coming to him. So uh, this is um, this is this ridiculous kind of win that Elijah has done, right? But he has wrapped himself up and run, and by the power of God, has you know, flash kind of like superhero flash gone boom. And gotten to Jezreel first. So, yes. Sorry. I just, I, I'm, all I can see in my head is Travis Kelsey with his shirt on. Yeah. <laughs> the answer to the the press box. Jason Kelsey. Jason Kelsey. Yeah. Which, whichever one. Whichever one did it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm thinking about Elijah had to have a lot of faith. Yes. To do this. Yes. And Yes. But now the rain, I'm wondering if after he had to send his servant out by the third time, is he thinking, God, you got to Yeah. Me. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I wonder if was he strong right to the end? I would think he would be starting to get a little bit nervous. I think that's a great question. I I, I mean, I know where I am, you know, I... God, I believe you. And then one bad thing happens. I'm like, okay, God, I still believe you. And then the second bad thing happens. I'm like, okay, God, I still believe you. And then like, then the, you know, the toaster explodes or whatever. I'm like, okay, I don't know what's going on, but it's time to stop. You know, the, but if he is, uh, and, and what, what adds even more to it, I wasn't sure if we were going to bring this in, but Paula, it's, it's perfect. Let me read you a little bit of chapter 19 because there's nothing more beautiful to me than pairing chapter 18 and 19. Because if you only read chapter 18, then what you get is, man, Elijah was locked in with God. I'm not like that. Ugh. Chapter 19. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done. Uh-oh. 
and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. You killed all of them, I am going to kill you. And Elijah, because he just had this super big battle and he had just seen how God worked and then he prayed and saw the water came, went, nah, -uh, no, wait, wait, no, that's not what he does. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. I, the Old Testament, just like the New Testament, the writers of this inspired by God, uh, you know, led by the Holy Spirit, they know what they're doing because it is not helpful for us to watch highlight reels of Michael Jack, of Michael Jordan dunk and dunk and dunk and dunk and then hand you a basketball and go, okay, go do that. I, I'm going to pass. No, thank you. You know, I can, I can maybe do this for a little bit if I don't have to actually move, right? But what we get is not that. What we get are these people who are swept up in the in the spirit of God and boldly proclaiming and then in the very next moment just like how we would be and terrified Jezebel doesn't have the power to do anything that God can't Elijah was standing face to face with the 450 prophets and one and Elijah says hey I'm uh, Jezebel says I'm coming after you and he goes ah and takes off right this is, so, so to, to, to connect with your question of, is he questioning? I, I think so. I, and I think we get this beautiful story of him being human and this beautiful story of him, uh, you know, you, what, what is the time that you are most likely to make your biggest mistake? I would argue it's right after you've had your biggest win, right? Because you start to believe your own press clippings and you start to believe, you know what? I really, I really am that good. What everybody, what that person said about not everybody, but what that person said about me, you know what? That's really true. Like that's when you start to get in real trouble. And so the, um, the picture of it and the, the, the picture here, I think is a picture of a guy trying to be faithful to what God has called him to. And he has these moments of incredible faith. I mean, that, well, you don't, this doesn't take anything away from chapter 18. He stood and put his life on the line, trusting that God would show up and answer, and God showed up and answered. And then he went ahead and said, God's going to bring rain even before the cloud came. And he is praying, and he is praying in this particular way, and he is praying and praying, and he has put, again, everything on the line for this to be, and time after time after time, and only after the seventh time did suddenly a cloud appear. And then all of a sudden, that was it. And the rains have come and the drought is over. So yes, uh, way too long an answer. But yes, I think there is, um, uh, I, I think there is a piece here of uh, the challenge for Elijah of, do you really believe? Do you really believe all that stuff that we just did? I'm going to show up in the way that I show up when I want to show up. And do you still trust that I'm going to do it? Did he believe in chapter 18 so fiercely because it aligned with his own plan versus in chapter 19? Oh, something outside of his own plan? now you're going to have to get up and come up here and start preaching. Cause that's actually a really good, like, uh, you know, when God agrees with us, it's very easy to have faith. But when God asks us to move to a place that would be more challenging, that's harder to do. I, I like that, but uh, there's there really is no way for us to know. But I, I think that's I think that's a really interesting idea. So part of what we're getting at here. Um, and part of why it's included in this in this chapter is that specific prayer, the prayer for rain. And the way that he is standing is the birthing pose. I mean, this is kind of the way um, that women in labor would have tried to deliver babies. And the the intentionality of that, the author says, is on purpose, that uh, God is bringing something new 
into the world here and the difficulty and the challenge and the struggle uh, that Elijah is facing is part of um, it's, you know, it, I don't, I'll just tell you, I don't love the whole labor pain analogy um, because I, I think it sort of short changes the uniqueness and the miracle and the trauma and horror of labor that like, Elijah's having a difficult time right now, but this is a very different experience, I think. But, but what, what we are getting at is the, the intentionality of God is bringing something new and doing something new. And the uh, physicality of it is indicating that, that Elijah is helping to bring this new thing into being, into reality, into life. And that is what... God is inviting us to do is to participate in the bringing of these new things in. And, uh, and, and so one of the things that, uh, well, one of the things that the chapter talks about is that God doesn't only dream about the church on fire, about revival coming and our church having new life and new hope, but God also dreams about the city reborn. God cares not just about our particular address and our particular sanctuary, but coming out of us, God wants new life and new, um, you know, new spirit to overflow into the world. Georgetown should be blessed because of the faithfulness that we are experiencing. God wants new life and new hope to come. And part of how God chooses to do that is through faithful people who are laboring and working with God, working to bring the new into the world. Uh, the next thing that uh, he mentions is when... The New Testament refers back to these kinds of stories. Um, he talks about the disciples. Uh, if you remember the story, uh, the disciples were in a place and they ran into uh, they ran into people who were using Jesus's name, and uh, but they didn't know Jesus. And so uh, James and John were like, you know, you know what you should do. You should call down uh, fire. You should call down lightning on them. You should strike them down. And, uh, and, you know, Jesus says, that's not what we do around here. Um, in fact, and, and the thing that the, uh, the author makes is where the temptation is for us to see the grand theatrics of the fire coming down and the priest getting slaughtered and all of this kind of stuff. When we are instructed by the teachers of the New Testament how to behave and what to do when we look back at Elijah, we look at the book of James, and what James says is you pray like Elijah. You pray in faith, but you pray in, in sort of that kind of that kind of faith that God is going to work and God is going to move, but you are in it and invested in it. And this is what it looks like. And this is how you jump in. So the instruction is not for us to find the people who are doing the wrong things who need to have fire called down on them. The instruction for us is to be faithful in prayer and continue to seek back to God. And just like all things, chapter 19 when Elijah is scared, it's because he's taken his eyes off of God and he's looking to the problems around him. He's Peter out on the water, looking at the water, not looking at Jesus. It is, it is a reminder and an invitation for us to keep focused on God and focused and centered on that, not on anything else. So, all right, questions, comments, thoughts, how are we doing? Ugh, all right. Internet struggling, friends. Do you have a question? Okay. That'd be awesome if you had a question. Okay. You can ask if you have. But. All right. Well, if you would, would you pray with me? God, we thank you for this time. We thank you, God, for the invitation to partner with you in helping to bring about the new into the world. 
God, show us where you are calling us to serve. Give us the tenacity and the faith to hold on in the midst of difficulty and storms. When the labor is difficult, God, help us to turn and to look to you. God, we pray for those on our prayer list and those in our heart who are struggling. We pray that you will bring peace and hope, healing and restoration, God. And God, for us, as we go about our week, we pray that we will find peace and connection and we will sense your spirit lead and we will be brave enough to follow. Guide us, God. Help us. We love you. In Christ's name, amen. All right, friends, uh, we will look at chapter nine next week. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, if anybody else is still online, thank you for joining us and uh, we will see y'all next time.